On May 3rd, I eagerly opened a message from my genetic counselor. And across the top, in big bold letters, it read, negative for pathogenic variants. Amen. Amen. <laughs> it went on to show that this battery of genetic tests that she'd done concluded that there is no genetic indication that the subject is at significantly increased risk of developing another cancer. And regarding my children, it said, there's no indication that cancer unaffected individuals in his family need to undergo testing for pathogenic variants in the aforementioned genes, hallelujah. It was a terrific message. And it was such a source of relief because I had been increasingly concerned that this rare and life-threatening tumor that I had from 2005 to 2010 could be the result of a pathogenic variant, a genetic abnormality inside of me, that if I passed along to my children, would have given them an increased likelihood of developing similar lethal tumors inside their bodies. I am negative for pathogenic variants. I danced a jig when I opened that message, literally. Yeah. What I'd really like is the same message with comparable good news about 21st century Christianity. The 21st century Christianity is negative for pathogenic variants. But I don't have that message. Instead, on May 3rd, the message I got about the church had to do with reading about how another prominent Protestant denomination in the United States was ending in divorce. And how another American Protestant tradition, the largest in the United States, was grappling with calculating the costs of mishandling its sexual abuse scandal. Friends, I'm sad to say there are pathogenic variants in 21st century Christianity. I'd like to be able to tell you different, but the messages that we're getting about Christianity with a capital C, 21st century, we have some problems in our tradition. Huh? Now the umbrella term I'm going to use for this pathogenic variance that we seem to be finding, that the umbrella term for, I'm going to use is a Jesusless Christianity. You know what I'm talking about? Where people say, oh, I'm a Christian, and th there's just no Jesusiness in that proclamation. Now, it won't be hard for you to notice the examples that are all around us. Some of us in this room were alive in the 20th century when Lutheran Nazis in Germany proclaimed Christ. And they would proclaim the words of Jesus and take his body and his blood in the morning or the uh, Ku Klux Klan in the American South. In the morning, they would participate in worship and they would proclaim the news of the gospel. And then at lunchtime, they would participate in a lynch mob and they would still make it back to church by Sunday night. <laughs> but that wasn't the beginning of pathogenic variants in Christianity. You can go back and for 500 years, from the 11th to the 16th century, the Crusaders and then the Conquistadors, they obliterated entire cultures of humanity in the name of Jesus. It was a Jesusless Christianity. 500 years in the Middle East and then what we now call Central and South America. But friends, even more recently, 
just last January, an outraged mob threatened to shoot and hang people in the name of Jesus in our own capital. There are some pathogenic variants within Christianity with a capital C. Now, a quick family-friendly note. I know everybody's anxiety just went up. I'm not suggesting that what happened on January 6th was un-American. <clears throat> in fact, violent revolution is purely in the DNA of the American story. It's in our genes. But what I am suggesting is that strident or violent revolution is not even in the same universe as Jesus of Nazareth. And so, as the church, whether we are Lutheran Nazis or conquistadors or 21st century patriots, we must be very careful about co-opting the name of Jesus and applying it to our endeavors, whatever they may be. There are some pathogenic variants within the capital C Christian tradition right now. Open your Bibles, if you would, to Matthew chapter 23. We're going to revisit Zach's lovely text that he read this morning. I guess this isn't Zach's text. He just got to be the one to deliver the woeful, complex news from Jesus to part of the established religion of his day. <clears throat> In Matthew chapter 23... Um, we see Jesus himself dealing with what I'm going to call a pathogenic variant of the people of God in his day. Now, these are the people that um, were identifiable leaders and representatives of his orthodoxy. But I'm going to call them um, the beloved and misguided group. There are beloved and misguided elements in all faith, tribes, and traditions. The beloved and misguided, or for shorthand, we could call them the BMs of the New Testament. <laughs> they are right here, and today Jesus is talking to the BMs of the New Testament. The beloved and misguided group. And you heard Jesus say over and over again, Woe, woe to you, Pharisees and blind guides, you hypocrites. So, you heard it read already, so now we're going to take two minutes and we're going to talk together with each other, with your neighbor. We're going to talk about these woes, and I'm just going to give you two minutes, and here are your two questions. Number one is, how many times does Jesus say woe to you, and then why does Jesus say woe to you over and over and over again? That's right, you have two minutes. I encourage you to talk to somebody you don't live with, although if you want to talk to somebody you live with, that's okay too. Two minutes, talk about how many woes and why woes? Ready? Go.
How many times did Jesus say to the BMs of the first <laughs> New Testament, woe to you? How many times? Seven. Anybody know anything about the number seven? That's a perfect number. It's a whole number. It's complete. Complete woe coming through in this text. And why is it that Jesus kept saying that to them? Woe to you, scribes. Woe to you, Pharisees. These were not bad people. These were people who knew scriptures better than anybody. They were people who taught the children and the adults in the religious context. Well, but what did they have wrong? Okay, that's basically what you're saying, kind of, yeah, shame on you. Although I don't, think, I don't like to think of Jesus shaming anybody ever, but it's something like that, yeah. But what did he do? What did they do wrong? What did they have wrong? Forest and trees. Forest and trees. Excellent. They were teaching trees and they could not see the Oh, forest. what a beautiful way to say that, Gene. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, they were teaching trees and they didn't see the whole forest. Their hands and their mouths did not match. Their life priorities and their practices betrayed their proclamations. What they were saying and what they were doing were distinctly different, and Jesus took exception over and over and over again. Woe to you, religious experts. Woe to you, clearly identified good religious people. Woe to you. And his allegations are harsh. You're keeping people out of the kingdom of heaven. You're, you're tying up heavy burdens on people, but you're not helping them. You're not helping them make their way. Seems like they had all the right ideas, but their, their instincts and their actions were really off. And Jesus was having none of it. You lock people out. You reminisce about your heritage with a lot of pseudo-piety. But the blood on your ancestors' hands is on your hands. You tithe. Oh, you tithe. You tithe mint and dill and cumin. But it's a substitute for the more important things that you should have been doing, which is mercy and justice and grace. Whoa. Whoa. To you, Pharisees, blind guides. And my favorite, this goes back to Eugene, I think. My favorite that Jesus says, he says, you strain out a gnat while you swallow a camel. I want a bumper sticker that says that. Can you think of any current gnats that people are straining out? while they swallow camels? I can think of about seven or 10. It's any like single issue right now of, that's of uh, ultimate importance. Whether are talking about gun laws or immigration or social justice or abortion. Or, it's, the, it's the one thing that people say, you have to get this one thing right or else you're completely lost. That's the gnat. And you strain out a gnat while you swallow a camel. I can imagine Jesus saying, oh, you're right. You're correct on gun control. You're correct on immigration. You're correct on abortion. But it matters very little because you've missed the whole enchilada of the kingdom of God. Because you're so stuck on that one single issue. You strain out a gnat while you swallow a camel. I think that is the best, most focused criticism I can think of at how there are pathogenic variants in 21st century Christianity. It's we're so busy straining out gnats and we just miss the bigger picture of the kingdom of God coming on earth as it is in heaven, like we just prayed. You strain out a gnat. Mm. Well, for the next six weeks, we're going to ask five questions to see if we can be less gnat-focused and more kingdom-focused. See if we can get back in touch with Jesus of Nazareth 
And these five questions are going to be this. What role does Jesus of Nazareth play in shaping the ethos and the self-understanding of Christianity? I would remind you that Christianity is a movement that Jesus started. It's his movement, right? So what role does that Jesus have in defining the mentality of Christianity with a capital C in the 21st century? That's the question we're going to keep asking. What role does Jesus have in this? Number two is, is continuity required between Jesus of Nazareth and his followers 20 centuries later? In order to claim the title Christianity, do we have to be in continuity with Jesus? Or can we just kind of do our own thing and call ourselves Christians? Number three, we're going to ask, in what ways might we domesticate or even dilute this radical revolutionary named Jesus of Nazareth in order to support our more comfortable traditions and practices? Do we domesticate him some in order so we can feel okay about how we live as Christians now? Question number four we're going to ask is, how might we inadvertently co-opt Christ to endorse the things that we want to do as we build our own personal kingdoms? Are we guilty of co-opting Christ occasionally? Applying Jesus to things that Jesus would have nothing to do with. And then the last question we'll ask over and over again is, how might a rediscovery of Jesus renew our discipleship and re-anchor our community and reprioritize our energies as a congregation so that moving forward, we are always saying, is this what Jesus would do? Is this how Jesus functioned? Is this how Jesus spoke? Is this how Jesus prioritized humanity? How might a rediscovery of this Jesus of Nazareth, this ancient first century Jew, how might a reacquaintance with him reform us in the 21st century? So that's what we're going to do for the next several weeks. We're going to look at those. And we're going to be using, um, I'm going to be reading along the way, and we're going to let this prompt our thinking. A title called Re-Jesus by Michael Frost and Alan Hirsch has just been rewritten, and I think it is a super helpful tool to help us honestly and humbly ask those questions. I just want to say, I told the praise team this before we began, um, this is not uh, an attempt to be critical of us. It's not an attempt to criticize what any of us say or do, except to the degree that what we're doing is inconsistent with Jesus, and yet we're calling it Christianity. That's the only, re that's the only places that I'm eager for us to have some conviction about this, you know. Um, I'm very proud and delighted of the way our congregation lives in this world and the way we have our being as Christ followers. But I suspect that we can smell even among us, the aroma of some pathogenic variants here and there in some small degree, maybe even in our own lives. And so we're going to look together at, uh, and listen to the, these two authors prompt our thinking and read Jesus. I love their premise and the aspiration of this book where Frost and Hearst say, we're going back to our founder and recalibrating our entire enterprise along Christological lines. Christology is just like, who is Jesus and what was he about? That's just the technical, theological word, Christology. That's what I want us to do. I want us to be honest about where we are. If we're going to define what being a Christian congregation looks like for the next 500 years, it seems really important to me that we'd be pretty clear about Jesus and that we would be in tune and sensitive to the things that are part of Christianity that just aren't very Jesus-y, you know? <clears throat> Let's see if we can get some clarity over the next four or five weeks together. Now, in this project, I see that there is um, at least one huge risk at hand and then one plaguing problem. The huge risk is that we are always very tempted to co-opt Jesus to our agenda. Now, you can get in any debate and conversation, and both sides are claiming that they're on the side of God in this thing, right? The other guy is the bad guy. The other idea is the wrong idea, and Jesus is on my side. It's almost a universal phenomenon, and that is a big risk for us always. And I want us to be honest enough to ask ourselves, is this really Jesus-y? You know, is this really Christian? And then there's this plaguing problem, and this is a huge plaguing problem, and that is that there's a difference between being salvation-focused 
and being Christ conformed. Those are not the same thing. What do you mean, Lance? Well, I mean this. I mean, we've, we've become, especially certain strains of Christianity, evangelical Christianity, has become very salvation focused. So much so that we have kind of boiled down the whole project of God into the ABCs of salvation. Yeah? Where if you accept and believe and confess, boom, you're in and you're kind of done. Or it's the four spiritual laws, or the Roman road, or any such compilation or digested version or abridged version of the gospel. Jesus invited humanity into lifelong transformation. But we too often have boiled it down into that if you accept Christ and you walk the aisle and you get plunged into the baptistry, then you're saved and once saved, always saved. And that has had catastrophic effects on Christianity. A confession with your lips and a plunge into a hot tub does not a Christian make. And yet, I will tell you this tragic news. Two of the last 20 people I've baptized, the last time I ever saw them was on their baptism day. That seemed to them like the conclusion. They made it. They're in. Once saved, always saved. I'm in the kingdom. I'm done. And I began to wonder, is that why Paul said, I'm really glad I didn't baptize more of you? Baptize Stephanus. Oh, wait, 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 wait. that's it. Because it's a misleading notion that once you're baptized and you come up out of the water, you're done. That's like day one, maybe day two. <laughs> that's the beginning of the journey, not the conclusion of it. But if we're salvation focused, then we have ticked the boxes, right? I, I mean, I'm dripping wet. I must be born anew. Certain strands of Christianity have offered a Jesusless gospel. Dietrich Bonhoeffer called it cheap grace and Christless Christianity because we've 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 substituted this life transformation project with an abbreviated four simple steps to become a Christian and go to heaven. Jesus didn't spend a lot of time talking about heaven as a later thing. He invited people into the kingdom of heaven, which is now, right? Good news, kingdom of God is now, it's near, it's here. Follow me, and I'll turn you into people who are participating in it. Kind of, he said something like that at the opening of his gospel. So, this is a big thing, and I want us to think about is uh, one of the things I want us to think about is is my faith a salvation centered thing, or is it a project of Christ conformity with every day of my life? One of them has a very high payoff right at the beginning I'm going to heaven. The other one has some stakes and some projects and a life of continual conformity. The way Paul said it is that we're to be continually conformed into the likeness of Jesus, right? That's Romans 8, 29. He said it something like that. So those are the things I want to be really sensitive to. You know, I was listening to the Youth Sunday video. I missed that Sunday. And I heard Conrad speak about how there's been a season or so of his life where his theological game in his head was really strong, but his heart was kind of empty and lifeless. This is not an indictment against Conrad, but I would say that that is a really good symptom of what can happen when we're salvation-focused and we're not Christ-relating. If we think we've got our ticket and we're in, we tend to not pay attention to the Lord who's leading us day by day to function in this world in dynamic kinds of ways with everybody we meet. Again, I'm not saying that's Conrad's problem. I am saying though that that is a common problem for people who are salvation-centered and not Jesus-conformed or conforming, yeah? Those are different things. Salvation ABCs or the Roman road or the four spiritual laws, those are really good maps that can show the way. But friends, a map will never enable you to experience the actual place. You can study a map of Vancouver day and night and never experience Vancouver. 
So let us not be map people or doctrinized people and miss this invitation for a dynamic relationship in an ongoing way with Jesus. Yeah. Those two are not the same. That's a plaguing problem. We'll talk more about it. Um, Alan Hirsch says this about some parts of our capital C Christianity, that evangelicalism's gospel too often does not produce Christ-likeness. It is patently designed not to, in so much as it delivers all the perks and promises of salvation with none of the pesky distresses of lordship. Once saved, always saved, almost allows you to hit the snooze bar indefinitely on Jesus and his life request uh, on us, yeah? Once saved, always saved. I'm in. I got nothing more to do. I'm just going to put that on the shelf because it's taken care of. And Jesus, I just want to suggest, Jesus doesn't even offer that in the New Testament. So let's be really clear about the, those two different things. Evangelicalism sometimes doesn't produce Christ's likeness because it's actually designed not to. So here's my proposal for the next few weeks. Let's get our Jesus right. Let, or theologically, let's get our Christology right. And let's let that Jesus inform what we know and understand about his church and about his mission in the world. Yeah. Let's get our Jesus dialed in and let him inform us about how we're to be his followers in this world. And friends, you have it right in some important ways already. We do. But let's look carefully over these next few weeks. That's my project. I do not wish to tie up heavy burdens and put them on us because Jesus says about that project, woe to you when you do that. I don't want to pile on heaviness. In fact, I want to lead us to places of greater freedom and greater liberation. Do you remember what Jesus said he came to do? He came to bring abundant life to humanity. And that's just one of these three final core truths I want to hold up. For the next five weeks, we're going to build a list of about 18 or so core truths about Jesus with this understanding that what Jesus <clears throat> told us was not to burden us with these things, but to invite us into a new kind of aliveness, a kind of vitality and vibrancy which, when we live it out, becomes, I don't know, he called it the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Michael Frost, Alan Hirsch, he says, you know, God's unambiguous intention is to shape you into Jesus' shape. It's what he wants for us, to be shaped into the little Christ, as C.S. Lewis would say it later. So there are some um, three core truths, and we're going to end on these. And I want us to be thinking about if we're to be shaped into the likeness of Christ, and these are some of the curves of Christ, we might say, how am I comparing to what Christ did as a Christian in the 21st century? And so the first one is this, that Jesus, he mediates grace and mercy from God to us. And my question is, Christian, do you mediate grace and mercy to humanity? Or is there a different sound coming out of you? God's unambiguous intention is to shape you into the shape of Jesus. And Jesus mediates grace and mercy into this world. Number two, Jesus offers forgiveness of sins. And so, Christian, my question is, do you offer forgiveness or do you rather prefer grudges? Do you prefer holding on to just a little bit of leverage on people when they sin that trespass against you? And then the third one is that Jesus, he embodies love for the whole world. In fact, that's the, vi the verse probably most of us memorize first, for God so loved the world, right? You know what the next verse says? That the Son of Man came into the world not to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved. Do we give off that aroma? We came not to condemn. We came to be part of Salvation Project. Yeah, these are three of these core truths we'll look at in a building way over the next week. Well, if this is true about Jesus, and if we're called to be like him, then church, I think we have some pretty clear marching orders, don't we? What is Christianity supposed to be like? Well, if it's going to be like Jesus, it's going to look like this. We're going to be mediators of grace and mercy. When somebody thinks of you, they're going to go, oh, man, that guy is super gracious. That woman, she's a Christian, so you know she's merciful. That's what we'll be known by. 
You know that Christian that lives down the road? She's really quick to forgive. And it's kind of setting me free. That's what Christians should be known for, right? Not violent revolution. Strident, angry sounds in the world. With the love that brings about a new kind of aliveness. Did I mention to you that I got a letter from my genetic counselor? <laughs> and in this letter it said, there are no pathogenic variants inside my body, which I'm passing along to my children. I was so excited to tell my kids this very good news. What I'd like to be able to do is to tell your kids that when it comes to their spiritual tradition and their faith, that this experience and this little body of Christ, that there are no pathogenic variants in this one, and that you need not be afraid about your faith. Because the people in this part of the body, we set up our lives, our practices, and our priorities to look just like Jesus. And it looked like this. I'd love to be able to tell your kids that news. You'd say, hey, no worries. Don't be afraid. Let's read Jesus, the church, shall we? Let's pray. God, I'm so thankful that you came not to condemn us, but to give us life forever with you. May we be quick and eager to jump into that kind of aliveness. And may we rejoice as we do so. Open us up and show us what we need to see, I pray. Thanks for meeting us where we are. And beckoning us into greater union with you, always. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen.